some of our very clever students at OU have resurrected the Founding Fathers and have been bringing them back to life on Twitter uh, these last few months. And they live as Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison and Adams on Twitter. And I just wanted to say, Peter Onif, where are you? That uh, Thomas Jefferson tweeted over lunch that you channeled him very well. So, <laughs> congratulations. You don't want to know what Alexander Hamilton said. <laughs> it's now my privilege to introduce to you the chairman of our history department and a man who's been a great champion uh, for our program and for the teaching of constitutionalism here at the University of Oklahoma, and that's Rob Griswold to introduce our next speaker. So please welcome to the stage Rob Griswold. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am indeed Robert Griswold, Hudson Family uh, Chair of History and Chair of the History Department here at the University of Oklahoma. Before I introduce this afternoon's speaker, and on behalf of the entire History Department, I want to thank President Bourne for making this event possible. He has a deep love for the study of history. He, in fact, majored in history in college, and that affection is reflected in today's event. I would also like to recognize and thank Professor Kyle Harper for his great work in establishing the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. Thank you for joining us for Founding Mothers, How Women Shaped the Founding with Rosemarie Zagari, Professor of U.S. History at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Professor Zagari earned her doctorate from Yale University, where she studied with Edmund Morgan. And before joining the faculty at George Mason, she taught at West Virginia University and Catholic University of America. Her scholarly articles have appeared in leading journals, including the Journal of American History, the American Quarterly, the Journal of the Early Republic, William and Mary Quarterly, along with numerous essays in edited collections. She has been the recipient of such honors as the Outstanding Article Prize awarded by the Southeastern 18th Century Studies Association, fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Antiquarian Society, and the American Philosophical Society. She has also had an appointment by the Fulbright Commission to the Thomas Jefferson Chair in American Studies at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Professor Zagari has appeared as an on-camera historian on C-SPAN, on PBS, and on the Fairfax Television Network. In 2009, she was elected president of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, and in 2011 was appointed a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Her latest book is titled Revolutionary Backlash, Women in Politics in the Early American Republic. She has also published another book on women in the early republic titled A Woman's Dilemma, Mercy Otis Warren and the American Revolution. The William and Mary Quarterly described her book, Revolutionary Backlash, as both path-breaking and field-changing. The Journal of the Early Republic likewise described the book as powerful, rich, and finely textured. As reviewer after reviewer has noted, the book compels us to rethink the meaning of politics, individual rights, male backlash, and women's history in the early republic. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rosemary Zagari. Thank you, Rob, and thanks to President Boren and to the University of Oklahoma and to all of you for coming. This is just a special occasion. I'm really honored to be among such a distinguished panelist, panel of scholars, and I'm just delighted that so many people care enough about the founding to come out and to listen to us talk about it. We think about it a lot, but we wish other people would think about it more, too. 
When the delegates to the Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776 to vote on the question of American independence, it's virtually certain that no one in that, that room, with the possible exception of John Adams, was thinking about the consequences of their pronouncements for the status of women. In the revolutionary era, matters of politics and government were thought to be exclusively the province of men. Men were the primary landowners. Ownership of land was thought to give men the virtue, independence, and stake in society that qualified them to vote. Women, on the other hand, were political ciphers. Legal proscriptions prevented married women from owning property. Most women had not had the benefit of a formal education and were believed to lack the knowledge to make informed decisions about issues involving politics and government. But perhaps most important, war, diplomacy, and state-making were considered to be beyond women's understanding and interest. Women were supposed to care more about hearth and home than about tyrannical kings and the right to self-government. Yet even as the delegates gathered in Philadelphia, they had already set in motion a chain of events that would significantly alter women's participation in the nation's political life and change the assessment of women's political potential and role in significant ways. Of all the men who gathered in Philadelphia in 1776 did not fully understand what was happening, the revolution they initiated was already beginning to spin out of their control. The story of the American Revolution for women then is a study of unintended consequences, a story of revolutions once begun that often take on shapes and directions that their leaders did not intend or anticipate, and sometimes greeted with less than full enthusiasm. In order to understand the experience of women in the American Revolution, I'd like to focus on the lives of a few particular women and explore through their lives the meaning of the revolution for larger groups of women that they represent. Unlike George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, theirs are not household names. Nevertheless, their lives provide a window on the larger collective experience of women during the revolution and will help show us how and in what ways women can legitimately considered, along with men, as the founders of our nation. The first woman I'd like to talk about is a woman named Esther DeBert Reed. Reed was born in London in 1747, the daughter of a wealthy merchant who traded with the, who's, who's a daughter of a wealthy merchant who had extensive trading relationships with the American colonies. In 1763, Joseph Reed of New Jersey, also the child of a merchant, went to London to study the law at the Inns of Court, a very common thing for American gentry to do in the pre-revolutionary period. There, through a common circle of social friends, he met Esther de Burt, and Esther and Joseph were immediately enamored of one another. Unfortunately, family circumstances forced Joseph Reed to return to America in 1765, just as Britain and the colonies were beginning their own pitched battle over the Stamp Act. Esther and Joseph corresponded for five years. And like another more famous couple, John and Abigail Adams, their letters were filled with writings about political events going on at the time. Both of them were obsessed with politics. Both of them couldn't wait to learn more about what would happen. And of course, they had both a personal and a political interest in what was going on, since the fate of their relationship, to some extent, depended on the fate of the colonies. Finally, in 1770, Joseph Reed, having become a successful lawyer in Philadelphia, returned to England, married his love, and took her back, along with her widowed mother, to settle in what was still part of the American colonies. In 
the couple subsequently had four children. Now, the political situation into which Reed entered as a young wife was one in which the controversy with Britain was already in full, sp full swing. And in this controversy, male political leaders had already discovered that they had a weapon, a secret weapon, that could be mobilized in their battles with Great Britain. And that weapon was women. Beginning with the Stamp Act in 1765, then with the Townshend Acts in 1768, and later in the Coercive Acts in 1774, the Continental Congress had struggled to find a way to make their grievances known to Britain. As I'm sure you know, they elected no representatives to Parliament. That's why taxation was such a powerful issue. No, no representation in Parliament, and yet they were paying taxes. So they had no representatives to express their grievances directly. So what could they do? The colonial legislatures sent protests and resolutions to Parliament. This informal body that we know as the Continental Congress met together with representatives from most of the colonies. And they, too, hammered out resolutions. They, too, sent protests. But the members of Parliament did not have to listen. They had no reason to listen. They were not responding to the grievances of their own constituents, to the people who represented them. So what could the Continental Congress do to apply further pressure on Britain to try and get hated acts of parliament repealed? Well, they came up with an ingenious solution, a series of non-importation, non-exportation agreements in which colonists decided to not import goods from Great Britain or not export certain goods to Great Britain. In other words, they would use the weapon of an economic boycott. And hopefully by pro putting political pressure and economic pressure on Great Britain, people in Britain would then put pressure on Parliament and get these hated acts repealed. Now, one thing I think in our usual telling of the American Revolution that gets overlooked is the status of the Continental Congress. We think, oh, a Congress, oh, a, uh, you know, of course, people would do what they asked. But remember, the Continental Congress was an extra legal body. In fact, from England's point of view, it was an illegal body. They had no official authority to make laws or to pass boycotts that would be imposed on the colonists. Their authority came directly from the people. And to the extent that they were successful was the extent to which people voluntarily cooperated with their dictates. And I think this is something that is worth remembering because this was this was kind of an alternative government, a kind of shadow government that emerged, and it really, its success really depended on the support of the people in a very direct way. And, even more pointedly, the success of these boycotts depended on the support of the people. If the people violated the boycotts, if they continued to glibly import goods from Great Britain because it made their lives more comfortable or more fashionable, then the Continental Congress really had little recourse as an official body. And as they thought about it, the Continental, leaders of the Continental Congress realized that if they were really interested in making these boycotts effective, they needed the support of the primary consumers in the colonies, the women. And so throughout the colonies, in the wake of the passing of these boycott calls for boycotts, leaders in each of the colonies began to reach out to women to try and mobilize their support, to try and get women to understand why it was so important to stop importing their favorite cloth, their favorite ribbons or hats or buttons or china or tea from Britain. They had to stop doing that if the colonial protests were to have teeth if the colonists were to be successful in protesting 
against these grievances that they had with Britain. And what's fascinating here is that these male political leaders were reaching out to women who were politically disenfranchised. They did not have the vote. They could not hold public office. And yet, women held enormous power of a certain kind. This economic power and also the social power that they had over their husbands and families. And men knew that. And so what you see in the 1760s and 1770s before the coming of independence are a plethora of articles in newspapers explaining to women why they need to boycott British goods, begging women, pleading with women, cajoling women, and asking them to support these political actions. You see poems and essays, some written by women, reaching out to women and asking them to support this cause of resistance. What this tells you, I think, is that men understood that women had this power, and they understood that in this unconventional kind of conflict, this unconventional kind of battle they were waging with Great Britain, they needed to reach out to different constituencies. This was true for men as well. The, the Continental Congress knew that they needed the support of lower class white men if the, if the boycotts were to be successful. So what these boycotts did was broaden the base of the resistance movement and in, in, encourage other groups to come in and join in this political movement that increasingly was expressing antagonism toward Great Britain because Britain was not responding to the complaints, protests, and uh, objections of the colonists to British rule. Now what we know too is that women responded to these calls. Some women began to make homespun cloth rather than buy imported fabric from Britain. They formed themselves into groups that they called Daughters of Liberty as female counterparts to the Sons of Liberty that were emerging in many cities and towns throughout the colonies. They held patriotic spinning bees where women would join with one another in making this cloth. They would wear garments made of, of homespun cloth. And this homespun cloth would be much more rough textured, it would much be, be, be much less fine than the kinds of goods that they could import from Great Britain. But by wearing this homespun cloth, women were visibly and vividly and physically displaying their political sentiments to the, to the public. They were showing other women and other people that they supported the American cause of resistance. Some women took other kinds of political actions. They identified merchants who were violating the boycott, and they would gather together and march en masse to protest these merchants' policies. There's even a case in Boston where the women gathered around the merchant and seized the merchant's keys for, for his shop from him and marched away. In Boston in 1767 and in Edenton, North Carolina in 1774, women wrote and signed their own non-importation agreements. It wasn't sufficient for them to just obey the dictates of the Continental Congress. They wanted to conceptualize their own views, put their own views down on paper, and let people know that they were really key participants in this movement. So when Elizabeth De, uh, Esther DeBert Reed emigrated to America in 1770. She saw that male political leaders had already begun to reach out and, and enlist women in the, in the patriot movement. And this, of course, would be something that she would immediately have been thrilled to see and wanting herself to participate in. With the coming of the war, with the War for Independence that it began in 1775 and then was formalized in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, Reed observed that women were called upon to make new and different kinds of sacrifices for the revolutionary cause. For ordinary women, the coming of war 
meant new kinds of sacrifices in terms of what they might expect in their day-to-day -day lives. They faced food shortages and shortages of other goods. In many places, there was rampant inflation. Sometimes there were smallpox epidemics because of the movement of troops and people. There was upheaval, dislocation, and the constant threat of violence. What this taught Esther DeBert Reed and other women is that in a conflict like the American Revolution, there was no separating the personal and the political. Whatever side you were on, whatever you wished to happen in the conflict with Great Britain, you could be drawn into the conflict whether you wanted to or not. But what the, the presence and immediacy of this conflict meant was that women were often forced to make political choices in their own lives. And by the way they acted in their lives, they could show their support for the American cause or resistance, that is, support the loyalist cause. Now, of course, they would often follow their husbands in these sentiments, but not always. And whether they liked it or not, women were sub subject to the deprivations of war and the conflict. Many women also faced other kinds of sacrifices and privations as a result of the coming of war. In order for this war, in order for this new United States government to be successful, many men had to be away from their families for long periods of time. They were called the way to serve in the newly constituted state legislatures. They were called the way to serve in the Continental Congress. They were called the way to serve in the Continental Army or in the local militias. At this time, what their husband's absences meant is that the burden of taking care of the farms and the families and the businesses fell then on the women. Women then had to take over in their husband's absences and make sure that the family and the farm were tended to. Sometimes they had to take care of and manage slaves or servants. A lot of women were not prepared for this. A lot of women suffered as a result of this. Many people, especially the leaders, lost fortunes in the revolution because their farms and businesses suffered during the revolution. Now, probably a lot of us have heard about what Abigail Adams experienced during the American Revolution, how much she missed John Adams, her husband, how much she wished they could be together. But Adams' experience was not singular. Many other women, including Esther de Reed, experienced these feelings, experienced these, these periods of aloneness. Esther de Reed, Reed's husband served in the Pennsylvania Assembly, became a military aide to George Washington, and then was governor of Pennsylvania. So she had to stay at home and take care of her four children without his help and support for many years. So what this meant is that women had to basically learn how to, how to take care of, of business at home and yet support their husbands in their political activities while they were away. And as I say, this was a great sacrifice for many women. And men recognized that this was a sacrifice on the part of women. They began to publish essays, and they began to produce orations in which they noted that women were as patriotic as men in which they celebrated women's contributions to the revolutionary cause, in which they honored women for stepping up to the plate, for doing what was necessary, and for making the men's participation possible. As one male orator put it, female patriotism, although it was different from men's, was of a kind entirely suited to their sex. So in their own way, Women were making a contribution to this revolutionary cause, and men understood without women's support, without women's cooperation, 
their own efforts might not occur. But Elizabeth DeBert Reed was different from a lot of other women in that she wanted women to make an even more direct contribution to the revolution. Because of her husband's position as an aide to George Washington, she was acutely aware of the condition of the American troops. She knew how poorly provisioned they were, how they often lacked basic supplies, they often lacked uh, shoes, they often lacked uh, guns, they often were poorly compensated, and they lived under dire conditions in which their lives were constantly in danger, all for the sake of, her, of their country. So as I say, Reed wanted to do more, and she wanted to have other women support her in making a gesture that would show the troops how much women cared. So in 1780, Esther de Burt Reed published an essay, first as a broadside and then in various Philadelphia newspapers called The Sentiments of an American Woman. And it was a rousing call to other American women to support the troops. And in this essay, she recalled the deeds of women of the past who had also sacrificed, women of biblical times, famous queens, fam famous military leaders of the past, like the Amazons. And she called on American women to do the same for their troops. And she said, like men, women were born for liberty and disdained to bear the irons of a tyrannic government. Women, she insisted, had as much stake in the outcome of this battle as men. Women were as invested in politics as men. And so in 1780, she took her campaign almost literally to the streets. She enlisted a number of her friends, and they actually spearheaded a drive to raise money for the support of the Continental Army. They called on their neighbors and family members and friends to donate funds for the troops. At, at a certain point, she and her friends actually went door to door to collect money. And this would be a shocking, a shocking episode at this time to see women going around, respectable, middle class, white women asking for money. But such was the intensity of their feelings, such was their fervor for the revolutionary cause that they believed that they should do this. Esther de Burt Reed and her, her supporters collected over $7,000 for the support of the American troops. And when it came time to disperse the money, Reed actually wanted to give gold coins to the troops in Washington's army. But when she consulted with General Washington, he was not keen on this idea. He was afraid that once the men got the money, they might use it for unsavory purposes like buying rum or other liquor and getting drunk, which he didn't see as productive. So, so over, over Washington's objections then, Reed had to change course. And she and her female supporters made shirts and socks for the troops. But in each object that they made, they put their name so that the troops would know this was a personal donation, as Reed called it, an offering of the ladies in support of the troops. And she hoped that this would not only give them physical comfort, but also moral support to know that the women of the newly constituted United States were behind them. And Reed's efforts spot, uh, engendered similar efforts in some of the other states. In other parts of Pennsylvania, women collected money in Maryland, Virginia, and New Jersey. So women were mobilized in support of this cause, and they wanted to directly show the troops that even though they couldn't fight on the field of battle, they were behind them. They wanted them to know that this was a collective cause for all Americans. So we see already some of the unintended, unintended consequences of the revolutionary movement. The boycott movement politicizes women. 
It makes them politically aware. It makes them understand that they have the potential to be politically involved and active. It makes male political leaders realize that women could make a contribution, even though women could not vote, even though women were still primarily wives and mothers, even in their traditional fem fem feminine roles, women could be political actors. They could be as patriotic as men, and they could make a sig significant contribution to the revolutionary cause. So as a result of these efforts of the women in the pre-revolutionary era and in the revolution itself, women were no longer politically invisible. Now the next woman I'd like to turn your attention to is a very different kind of person, a person you may have heard of, a woman named Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley was born in Africa around 1750. She was captured and sold into slavery as a young child. But unlike most slaves, Phyllis Wheatley wound up in a very congenial environment for an enslaved person. She was purchased in 1761 by Susanna Wheatley, the wife of a wealthy Boston mer merchant. She was to be a domestic slave rather than a field hand or work as a domestic worker on a large plantation, which was the fate of most female enslaved people at this time. And she was also very fortunate because the family into which she landed was very, very attentive to her. They quickly observed that she was a very quick learner, extremely precocious, and with a keen intellect. And rather than suppress or rep repress Phyllis's intellect, they nurtured it, they cultivated it, they encouraged it. They taught her to read and write. Not only that, they taught her mathematics, they taught her geography, history, and even the classics. In fact, they taught her to read in Latin. And even the most educated women in America at this time, one of the most educated being a woman named Mercy Otis Warren of Massachusetts, did not know how to read the classical languages. That was the true hallmark of a gentleman, of an educated person. But yet Phyllis Wheatley learned to read Latin. At some point as a teenager, probably with the Wheatley's encouragement, Phyllis took up her pen and began to compose poetry. The Wheatleys were stunned by Phyllis's gift and began to seek publication for her works in newspapers. One of her poems on George Whitfield, the itinerant minister, was published and it gained widespread attention both in the British colonies and in England. So Phyllis Wheatley then was actually gaining fame as a, as a poet in the years just prior to the American Revolution or to the Declaration of American Independence. The Wheatleys actually believed that Phyllis's work should be published as a book, and they tried to find an American publisher for her work without success. So in May of 1773, they sent Phyllis along with their son to England. There, Phyllis Wheatley made contacts with many notable people who were supportive of her talents and impressed by her abilities. She gained a patris, patroness the Countess of Huntingdon, who sponsored the publication of her book. And in late 1773, Wheatley's book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, was issued, first in, in England and then later in America. Phyllis's mistress, Susanna Wheatley, died in May of 1774, and at some point thereafter, Phyllis was freed. She left the bonds of slavery. She was given her freedom. After her mistress's death, Phyllis married a free black man, John Peters. They had three children. In freedom, however, Wheatley found unexpected challenges. She continued to write poetry, but she had a very difficult time supporting her family. She had to work as a charwoman. She could barely have the means to keep her family alive. Always in frail health, 
in December 1784, just as the American War for Independence was ending, Wheatley died, never having published her proposed second volume of poetry. Despite all her talents and gifts, Wheatley's life ended in impoverishment. American society lacked the opportunities for a gifted, educated woman like Wheatley to find employment. And of course, her situation was all the more compounded because she was also a free black woman. Tragic though it may be, what Wheatley's life allows us to see in sharp perspective some of the issues that the American Revolution raised for enslaved black women and for the white Americans who began to ponder as a result of the revolution the contradiction between slavery for black people and freedom for whites. First of all, the very existence of credible literary works produced by a person who is both female and black challenged stereotypes about those groups. People who cared to pay attention would see that black people and women were not necessarily inherently inferior, inferior in either intellect or ability. It suggested that, her life suggested, with the proper environment and education, women and African Americans could be capable of the same attainments as white men. In fact, they could exceed, they could excel. Second, although much of Wheatley's poetry is religious in nature, she did publish a number of poems with patriotic themes. And what's clear from these patriotic, patriotic poems is that she completely identified with the American cause. She saw herself as an American. She supported the resistance movement against Great Britain. She objected to British tyranny, and she supported the establishment of an American nation whose future she saw as great and impressive. In 1775, she wrote a poem to George Washington, to His Excellency George Washington, in which she praised Washington's prowess as commander-in-chief and celebrated the American struggle against Britain. Not only that, she actually sent her poem to George Washington. So here she is, she's still an enslaved woman, and she sends her poem to the commander-in-chief of the American Continental Army. Washington, to his credit, responded to Wheatley's poem generously and graciously, and the two actually met one another in 1776. It shows you then that even a slave owner like George Washington was willing to recognize merit when he saw it. Not so another American political leader, Thomas Jefferson, who dismissed Phyllis Wheatley's poetry as inferior and not worth the label of literary. Nevertheless, I think what this whole episode shows us is that for Phyllis Wheatley, and for the Americans who witnessed the flourishing of her career, it was possible to see that black people were capable of much more than anyone had given them credit for. Surely, most of the leaders sitting in Philadelphia in 1776 would not have anticipated this as part of the revolutionary legacy. But as exceptional as Wheatley's abilities were, she was not the only enslaved person to believe that the rhetoric of the American Revolution applied to them. In many states, North and South, enslaved people took the ideas of liberty, equality, rights, freedom, and started applying them to themselves. In some states, enslaved people petitioned their state legislatures for their liberty. Sometimes they appropriated the very words of the Declaration of Independence in asking for their freedom. In many places, enslaved people did not bother with formalities. It's believed that anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 enslaved people took advantage of the dislocations of war and freed themselves by running away during the American Revolution. In fact, both Washington and Jefferson lost slaves during the Revolution much to their chagrin, 
Surely this was an unintended and to many outrageous consequence of the American Revolution. Finally, the coming of the American Revolution brought home to many white Americans the contradiction, not to say hypocrisy, of American colonists who objected to infringements on their freedom, but who at the same time systematically deprived black people of their most basic rights and liberties. While recognition of this contradiction did not lead to an immediate end to slavery, it did lead certain people, among them George Washington, to voluntarily manumit their slaves. And there were a large number of slave owners who did free their slaves. Northern state legislatures put slavery on the road to abolition, either immediately or gradually. The federal government prohibited slavery in the Northwest Territory in 1787. And the US Constitution, though admittedly in many ways a pro-slavery document that protected slavery in many regards, did not once use the word slave or slavery in the text. For many white Americans, slavery had become an embarrassment, a moral blight that should be put on the road to extinction. Of course, for a substantial minority, slavery remained an issue of property rights, not human rights. And for them, the next 60 years was a pitched battle in which they tried to justify slavery within a political system that was dedicated to equality and natural rights. Surely this too was another unintended consequence of the American Revolution. Finally, I'd, I'd like to turn your attention to another, even more obscure woman, a woman named Elizabeth Alexander Stevens. And Elizabeth Alexander Stevens is noteworthy mostly because of where she lived. She lived in Essex County, New Jersey. She was married to a wealthy man who died, and after he died, she moved into Essex County, where she owned a substantial amount of property on which she paid taxes. Why is this significant? Well, in New Jersey, alone among all the 13 states, women were allowed to vote, to cast ballots for candidates to local, state, and federal office from the period 1776 to 1807. This is over 100 years before the passage of the 19th Amendment. So how is this possible? It was possible because in the 18th century, both in Britain and in America, suffrage was not considered a natural right. It was considered a privilege of property, a property right. Only those earning, owning a certain amount of property were allowed to vote or hold public office. By custom, this meant men, although theoretically it could have been included women, but it didn't. By custom, only men voted. Now, traditionally, men owned most of the land, but also by custom, married women could not own property, but single and widowed women, unmarried women, could own property. So in some places, in the colonies and then in the early United States, unmarried and, women, and widowed women were paying taxes on property they owned. Why is this important? Well, for some women who listened carefully to the rhetoric of the American Revolution, to the slogan, no taxation without representation, this was a very personal issue. They looked at their own condition and they saw they were paying taxes, and yet they could not vote and did not have a voice in government. One of these women was Hannah Lee Corbin of Virginia, the sister of Richard Henry Lee. She was a wealthy widow who paid taxes on her land. In 1778, she wrote a scathing letter to her brother asking why revolutionary principles did not apply to her. Why, she asked, could, should she be deprived of her voice and representation when she had as much stake in society as many men? Her brother, Richard Henry Lee, 
was flabbergasted. He simply did not anticipate this line of inquiry, and he had no adequate rejoinder for her question. He simply pointed to custom and tradition as the grounds of exclusion. But what this meant, in fact, is that Hannah Lee Corbin and all the widows paying taxes like her were being deprived of representation simply on the basis of their sex, simply because they were women. Surely, no one in Philadelphia in 1776 anticipated this. Maybe John Adams, because Abigail had primed him. <laughs> now, what happened in New Jersey is that the legislatures, legislators in the state of New Jersey took this principle of no tax taxation without representation seriously and, and took it to its furthest extremes. In 1776, the Continental Congress asked each state to write its own constitution. And when the state of New Jersey was writing its first constitution, when it devised the provision regarding suffrage, it simply talked about suffrage in gender neutral terms. It said that all inhabitants who are worth 50 pounds proclamation money are entitled to vote. Now, this gender neutral language is not in and of itself significant. If you look at the early state constitutions, more than half of them do not limit voting to men. What was different in New Jersey is that in 1790 and in 1797, state legislators clarified the meaning of this provision and they passed election statutes in which they referred to voters using the pronoun he and she. So New Jersey actually extended the franchise to all adult members of society who met the property qualification for voting. And that meant free blacks as well as white women who were unmarried and owned property. And so that's how it became possible for a woman like Elizabeth Alexander Stevens to vote in New Jersey. Both political parties began to court the women's votes. At the same time, as you might imagine, this experiment in female suffrage was very controversial. Many men, as well as many women, found the idea of women voting strange, foreign, and unacceptable. It violated their notion of what men's and women's proper roles were. While men were certainly perfectly prepared to involve women in informal political activities, such as boycotts, they did not anticipate enlisting them in direct political actions, such as voting. So throughout the 1790s and into the early 19th century, there were frequent diatribes against female suffrage in pamphlets, newspapers, and in the New Jersey legislature itself. Many of the attacks were outrageous, hysterical, and self-contradictory. Some said women lacked the knowledge and judgment to participate in politics, but others feared that women were getting too knowledgeable about politics. Some men feared that women were acting too much like men by participating. They abhorred the undue influence of women on politics, accusing them of forming a petticoat faction or of becoming manly women, as they put it. And they feared if women could vote, they would inevitably start to run for public office. That was truly horrible. As one poem in New Jersey put it, to Congress low, witches and widows shall go, like metamorphosed witches, clothed in the dignity of state and eke in coats and breeches. So women who ran for office would stop wearing their petticoats and would start wearing coats and breeches. Oops. <laughs> um, anyway, if you, if you know of uh, Abigail and John's correspondence on this issue of women that occurred in 1776, you know that John was aware of this, of, of Abigail's 
upset about the status of women. And, and his reply was that women have more influence unofficially, indirectly, and he talked about the sway of the petticoat. But what this episode in New Jersey indicates is that while men were content to acknowledge that informal means of influence, many of them were quite upset and quite objected to this more formal kind of enfranchisement that was evident in women actually casting ballots. So there were serious efforts made in the legislature to disenfranchise women in 1799 and 1802. Finally, after a particularly contentious election in 1807, the legislature was able to pass a law that disenfranchised both women and free blacks. They did it because there were accusations of fraud, but it's interesting when there are accusations of fraud, what the legislature did was disenfranchise the most underrepresented and marginalized groups, the women and free blacks. And thus ended in 1807, this brief experiment in women voting. Now, you might say, did the women rise up in protest? And somewhat surprisingly, they did not. And to understand why not, we have to go back to understanding what voting meant at this time. Remember, voting at this time was understood as a privilege of property, not a natural right. It would be the Jeffersonians who, in the early 19th century, would launch a state-by-state -state campaign to eliminate property qualifications for voting for white men. And their argument would be that voting is a natural right. Now, even Jeffersonians acknowledged that women had natural rights. But when it came to voting, Jeffersonians were not prepared to be logically consistent. When it came to voting, they simply said, that it was extraordinary, absurd, and unnatural to enfranchise women. But the experiment in New Jersey stood as an indelible reminder that it wasn't necessarily so. So, in what sense then can we consider women like Elizabeth Stevens, Phyllis Wheatley, and Esther DeBert Reed founders, and the women like them? How can they be considered founders of our nation? Well, as I said at the beginning, without their participation, male revolutionaries would not been, have been able to be successful in their fight against Britain. With all due respect to the brilliance and the creativity and imagination and bravery of the male political leaders, they needed followers. And without followers, their efforts would have failed. And women's efforts, particularly in the boycott, were very important. And then during the Revolutionary War itself, they were necessary on the home front for the men to be able to conduct the direct business of war and governing. So what this meant was that the revolution enlisted women's support, made them politically conscious, encouraged men to think of women as political agents, it gave women political identities and forced men to acknowledge that women did indeed play a significant part in the political process, indirect though that role may be. Even as wives and mothers, women could be patriots and revolutionaries. And this was significant in the post-revolutionary era. Because women were understood as political beings, they came to be understood as citizens who had certain rights. They could play a role in a certain way in inculcating civic virtue and patriotism in their children and husbands. And this in turn had consequences because if, men, if women were to be the first teachers of patriotism, women needed to be educated. So educational opportunities for women expanded. You had the founding of a large number of seminaries for women, of institutions that would educate women. You have a skyrocketing in the rate of female literacy. And that, in turn, led to women's continuing participation in informal political activities, in informal civic life. <clears throat> 
women participated in charitable societies and benevolent organizations, in patriotic festivities, public celebrations, and even in party political gatherings in the first days of the New Republic. Even more important, I would say, is that women came to be understood as the bearers of rights, as possessing natural rights. And we know that natural rights, unlike other kinds of rights, are inherent and unalienable and cannot be contravened by any government. Especially after 1792, when Mary Wollstonecraft published her seminal work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, many authors in the United States began debating, discuss discussing, negotiating the question of women's rights. And the issue was not that women had rights, that was now a given, but what rights did women have? Did they extend to political rights? Many authors talked about women having equal rights with men. What did that mean? And who should enforce and support those rights? In general at this time, equality or equal rights for women tended to be interpreted not in a political sense, but in terms of women's equal ability to have virtue, patriotism, and intellect, to have these same capacities along with men. And while to some of us today that doesn't seem as significant as the possession of voting rights, I would argue that it was an increased, incredibly significant change. Women were no longer politically invisible. They were now acknowledged to have natural rights. It was just a question of what kinds of rights those should be and whether the state should have a role in guaranteeing those rights. And these principles, these revolutionary principles of equality and natural rights would provide a basis for women in later generations. In the 1840s, the first women's movement would emerge by women who seized on the Declaration's principles of equality of natural rights. And at the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, they would begin their Declaration of Sentiments of, uh, by invoking the Declaration of Independence, saying that all men and women are created equal. And in that Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, they would demand the same political rights as men. Finally, what women's participation in the revolution reminds us is of the larger social changes affected by the American Revolution. As wise and important as male politically leaders were to the revolutionary movement, they needed the support of followers, including women. By calling on ordinary Americans to support the revolutionary cause, these leaders empowered ordinary men and women and transformed the basis of political participation. No longer would ordinary white citizens accept without question the dictates of their leaders. No longer would a wise, virtuous elite be able to assume the deferential acquiescence of the masses to their actions. Once that genie was out of the bottle, it was almost impossible to put it back in again. In separate and distinct ways, American men and women would join together to create a new kind of government an experiment in liberty. And one of the most distinctive hallmarks of that experiment would be an ongoing struggle by those who were excluded from power to invoke the principles of equality and natural rights as a way to demand and justify their inclusion. Unique among world revolutions up to that point, the American Revolution gave those who were marginalized or impressed the principles through which they and their advocates could combat their own exclusion. The continuing challenge of the American Revolution for us today is to interpret those principles of equality and natural rights for our own time. Thank you. <laughs>